Welcome to the St. Louis Young Adults Bible Study Fellowship Podcast. Today, our substitute teaching leader, Jacob Wearson, will be discussing God's creation and purpose for humanity from the book of Genesis. St. Louis Young Adults Bible Study Fellowship, or BSF, is currently meeting virtually on Zoom every Monday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Central Time. For more information and to connect with our class, visit bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. That's bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. Let's prepare our hearts, open our Bibles to the end of Genesis chapter 1, and join Jacob as he shares truths from God's Word. Hello, friends. Welcome to the third, if you can believe it, the third BSF lecture of the year. Uh, So blessed to uh, open God's Word uh, with you as we discover God's creation for humanity and His purpose uh, for the world uh, from Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Um, can't believe we're also about to enter into the month of October. Can you believe that? Uh, it has been six months since we have been experienced. We as a nation are experiencing this uh, global pandemic, um, but God continues to speak to us even in these moments of suffering and great change, uh, and I am confident uh, that God is speaking us, speaking to us uh, in Genesis chapter 1. So let's open up our Bibles. We are in Genesis 1, starting in verse 26, and we're heading into uh, chapter 2, verse 25 in this week's lesson. And as we get started, as we dive in and see God's creation of humanity, there's a few things um, that I just want to go over with you and, and a couple questions I want to ask. Um, what has been your faith life in these difficult times, in these difficult moments? Uh, are you asking uh, questions about uh, your faith and the world? Uh, see, the fact of the matter is, I really think a lot of people are asking some fundamental basic questions, right? And one of the most obvious is why suffering, right? Why a pandemic in this time? Why do we have to live in the midst of this pandemic? Uh, is there life after death? Is there purpose or is all of this just a cosmic accident and the pandemic another example of a cosmic accident? These are big questions that our that our society asks, that our culture asks. But what about you personally? Um, how do you view yourself? Uh, how do you view um, your, your personhood, your, your personality? Uh, do you often find yourself comparing yourself to others? Uh, do you look at the world around you on social media? And yes, even in a pandemic, social media is running strong. Do you look at your others, your friends on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever? Are you comparing yourself? Do you feel insignificant and small? Uh, maybe you yourself are asking those same questions. What is the purpose of all of this? What is the meaning of all of this? Do I personally matter? Do I have any worth or value. We live in a cult- culture that likes to exist without meaning, right? The concepts, the worldviews of postmodernism, of naturalism, that we are just an accident, a cosmic accident, speak loudly in our culture, unfortunately. But praise God that his word has been preserved and that the Bible speaks in strike contrast to the spirit of our age. God is speaking to us from Genesis 1, and he is saying loudly, you do have a purpose. You do have worth and value. And even though you compare yourself to everyone around you, you are unique. God knew you before he formed you in your mother's womb, and he is an eternal God-glorifying purpose for each one of us. See, those truths answer the big questions of why are we here What's the meaning and purpose of all of this? But it also asks those deep questions that we ask in our own heart. Do we have value? Do we have purpose? Let's dive in to Genesis chapter one, and let's discover that purpose that God has for us together. So open our Bibles. We're in verse 26 of chapter one. And our lecture outline today has two divisions. The first division, uh, humanity created for God's glory. Uh, That's Genesis 1, verses 26 through chapter 2, verse 3. And the second division I'm going to be talking about today is humanity created for relationship. That's Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 25. So that'll take us through the end of chapter 2 here. So division 1, humanity created for God's glory. This is Genesis 1. Um, starting in verse 26. So let's read verse 26 because there's a couple profound truths that we notice right off the bat. Verse 26 starts with, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, 
And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. All right, let's stop right there. First verse, there's two things that we have to notice, some two profound truths that we can take with us. Um, What's that profound truth? Well, first of all, uh, God has created humanity, right, in this verse, and humanity is different than any other creation. We are different than any of God's creation. We are his crowning achievement. First thing we got to notice. Secondly, we have an introduction here into the Christian doctrine, which is called the Trinity. We're going to unpack those in just a second. All right, that's first observation. Humanity is created, and we are created differently than any other of his creation. So why do we say this? How do we know this? Well, look in verse 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. Look at the beginning of verse 26 again. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. We are created in the image and likeness of God. No other creation bestows uh, this incredible reality. So what does it mean? We have to ask ourselves a couple questions, right? How are we different than the rest of creation? I think a better question is, what does it mean that we're created in the image and likeness of God, right? Because we know uh, why we're different, because we are created in his image. We are created in his likeness. What does that mean? How does that differentiate us from the rest of creation? Well, first of all, to be created in, in his image and likeness, let's simply consider us as humans. Let's, let's unpack our nature a little bit. So first of all, right, what are some abilities that we as humans have? Well, we have the ability to reason, right? We have the ability to think. We have the ability to act rationally. Um, but how is is this different from other animals, from other creatures on the earth? Yes, we do have a mind, but we really use our mind in some incredible ways. At the beginning, I was talking about some deep questions that we as humans ponder. We are the only creatures on this earth, right, that ponder the great questions of life. Why are we here? What is the meaning of it all? Is there life after death? Is this all there is? These deep existential questions are unique to the human mind. I'm an animal lover. I'm a dog lover. I have two dachshunds here uh, in Texas that I've grown up with my whole life. Uh, I love dogs, but my dog does not wake up in the morning and think to himself, gosh, I wonder what the meaning of life is. I wonder after these short years on earth, if there is a life after death. My dog does not ask ask that question. In fact, no animal on this planet asks that question. Now, I'm not knocking animals. Again, I'm an animal lover. Creation is amazing. God has created some amazing animals, some amazing uh, creatures in the earth. But we are the only species to consider these deep questions. What is the purpose? Is there a God? That fundamental question is something that God put in our hearts, right? We read in the Bible that God has placed eternity in in the hearts of man. So our reason, our intellect is far superior than any other creation on the earth. What's another example of how we are created in God's image and likeness? Well, we have the ability to be personal. We have the ability to pursue relationships. Now you might say, wait a minute, I look at cre- creation, I look at animals, I, I look at um, dogs and, and creatures in the jungle. They have relationships with their offspring, right? You have um, mothers caring for their offspring in the animal kingdom. So how are we different? How does being personal differentiate us? uh, And how is that an example of of how we're created in the image and likeness of God? Well, let's go back again to verse 26 and read, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. This is going to take us to the point that I mentioned earlier, that we see the introduction to the doctrine of, of the, of the Trinity, which is central to the Christian faith. Real quick, what is the Trinity? I mean, I can't believe I'm saying real quick. It's one of the most profound doctrines and beliefs of our Christian uh, heritage. But what is the Trinity? In short, uh, the Trinity is wh- how we describe the God that we worship. It's a doctrine that describes God's nature, God's essence. So God has given us the Bible, and throughout Scripture, um, there are woven into it truths of God's nature, God's character, and yes, even God's very essence. The Trinity is the belief that God is three distinct co-equal persons eternally existent in one God. A great definition that I read from Ligonier Ministries um, is God, the Trinity is essentially God is one in essence and three in person. So what does that mean? 
First of all, we are a monotheistic religion, right? Christianity is monotheistic, meaning we believe in one God. So we do not worship three different gods. Three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, those are not three different gods. They are three eternally distinct persons, but they're one God. They're of one God. Additionally, we do not worship a God with multiple manifestations. Uh, God does not manifest himself into the Spirit one day and manifest himself into the Son the other day. No, what do we mean when we say God is three eternally co-equal distinct persons? Eternally, meaning no beginning, no end. The Father has no beginning, no end. The Son has no beginning and no end. And the Spirit has no beginning and no end. Eternally existent, three distinct persons, but one God. It's not a manifestation. They're different. They're distinct persons, but they're all of one God. Now, this is a complex understanding of who God is, but it is clear from Scripture that this this does describe the nature and essence of God far beyond our comprehension, um, but it is not illogical. It is the reality of who God is. It's an incredible truth, but it is a mystery. It's hard for us to comprehend. Okay, so why do I bring up the Trinity when I talk about we as humans are personal, right? We have the ability to be personal. Well, we see God is a personal God, right? What do we see in verse 26? We see the person, the, the persons of the Trinity are present at man's creation, at the creation of the universe, but also at the creation of mankind. Look at verse 26 again. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Who is God talking to? Humanity had not been created yet. Wait a minute. We were introduced, though, to the spirit of God in the opening verses of chapter 1 in Genesis, right? The spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We read, if we read the gospel of John in chapter 1, John says that Jesus was present at creation and all things were created through the second person of of the Trinity, Jesus Christ right? Remember, eternally existent, three persons, one God, no beginning, no end, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, distinct persons, but eternally existent. They're there. They, the, the Trinity is present in creation, and God, his very essence, his very nature is relational because he has, there's three in one, and, they're, and the Trinity is communicating in verse 26 at the creation of mankind. So, immediately we see God is creating us out of, of uh, uh, out of relationship and for relationship. We think about the personal relationships that we have with our family, the personal relationships we have with our friends, with our spouses, right? We as humans, it is not good for us to be alone. We're going to read that later in chapter two in just a moment, right? Not good for us to be alone. We desire relationship. We see that especially now during a pandemic. Uh, when we are in quarantine, we're forced to uh, maybe see less of people, right? You are seeing clearly that mankind desires relationship with other people, but ultimately we were created for a relationship with our creator God. So we have the ability to be personal because we were created out of that Trinitarian relationship. We were created for relationship. In addition to this too, we have the ability to love people for their own sake, right? If we're going back to how, what does it mean that we were created in God's image and likeness? It's this idea of of uh, love, of sacrificial love, right? That is present in scripture, but it's also present in us. We are the only uh, creation that can experience truly this sacrificial love. Now, you might say, wait a minute, there's other, you know, in the animal kingdom, uh, you might see, you know, sacrificial um, care from from a mother and her offspring. I understand that. I'm not a scientist. I don't pretend, pretend to understand all of the animal world. What I'm saying here is, Animals primarily care for their offspring out of instinct. We as humanity, as humans, we have the ability to choose to love people for their own sake. We love people out of selfless love. We love, we want what's best for our family, from our, for our friends, for the people in our Bible study group, because we truly love them, right? It's not, it's not a, 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 an instinct. It's more than that. It's a deeper connection that we have with other people. And this, of course, is perfectly modeled in the sacrificial love of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, right? In his death and resurrection, he gave his life to save the world, all right? That beautiful picture of sacrificial love is actually present in humanity. We have the ability to tap into that because our God is a sacrificial, loving God. This is beautiful. These are just some of the ways that we see, um, that, that we, as we understand what it means for us to be created in God's image 
and likeness. Truly, as Psalm 139 dictates in verse 14, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. All right, but let's move along here in the rest of Genesis, Genesis chapter one. What does this all mean? Um, you know, what does it mean? We're created in God's image and likeness. We see the Trinity present in these first few verses. Let's get, continue on here. God uh, continues to differentiate humanity from the rest of creation. As in verses 28 and 30, we see uh, that God has given mankind the responsibility to subdue the earth, right? To utilize the earth and all of its vast resources for food, for nourishment, for cultivation, but also to care for it. We are, we are to care for the earth. We are to be faithful stewards of the earth. He also give us, gives us a, a command to be fruitful, to multiply, to populate the earth. And then we see in verse 31, God saw all that he has made, and it was very good. We are the only of God's creation. We're the only kind of God's creation where he looked at us and said, not not just that we were good, we were very good. In Genesis, as we conclude here in this first section, in the first few chapters of Genesis chapter 2, again, we see... um, In verse 2, it says, By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating uh, that he had done. So as we conclude here in this first section, we see God rested. Um, I would encourage you, by the way, to dig into the notes a little bit because uh, the notes do a good job of of fleshing this concept of the Sabbath, of, of the seventh day being blessed and being holy a little bit more. But what does it mean? Why, why do we see here in, in these verses, why do we need to know that God rested? Um, well, first of all, I think it's important to note that I, I don't think it means that God ceased from all work, meaning he just threw up his hands and said, I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm, gonna, I'm just, I'm just going to stop doing anything. Uh, that's not necessarily what this verse means. Uh, if we read the Gospels, we understand the life and ministry of Jesus. He says, my father and I, we are always working. But it highlights a certain rest here. It highlights, it does highlight a rest. And this, these verses were the foundation in Exodus for um, keeping the Sabbath holy in uh, the book of Exodus and that uh, uh, in the law for the Israelites, right? That keep, the Sabbath day, right, was part of the Jewish law. And um, this, well, this was the foundation for that law that God instructs the Israelites in Exodus. But I think it's for us here as Christians, as part of the new covenant, Um, it's important for us to see that God values rest. God values a time for us to just pause, right? To rest from our work. And ultimately, as we learn in Exodus and again further in the New Testament, as this idea of the Sabbath is expanded upon, it's really important to rest and to worship God, right? That's, That's what makes the Sabbath day holy. Now, we're under the new covenant. We're not under um, Jewish law anymore. Uh, the, I think the Sabbath is still important. Uh, Hebrews talks about the Sabbath for the believer, the rest, the Sabbath rest that we have as Christians in Christ. Um, so I would, again, I would encourage you, read the notes a little bit more, but highlighting this idea of rest, it's important to pause, it's important to reflect, it's important to remember our Creator and to connect with our God. So all of that to conclude with the principle here in our first section Our origins, our purpose, our meaning are found in our creator God. Our first principle, again, is our origins, purpose, and our meaning are found in our creator God. See, our lives, each one of us, is marked with eternal worth and value. We see as we're created in the image and likeness of God. God declares that the creation of mankind is not just good, it is very good. God sought his creation was so beautiful and glorious, that he rested on the seventh day. We are created with all sorts of purpose and value and meaning. I love what the Westminster Confession says, the chief end of man is to worship God and to enjoy him forever, right? Our meaning, our value and purpose comes from the one who created us. That makes sense, right? He created us. We belong to him. Our very identity, our very framework for living starts with him. Our personhood has dignity and, and worth that is given to us by God. And even the way we live our lives is to glorify God, right? We see as God gives mankind the responsibility to care for the earth, 
meaning our actions, our responsibilities, our everyday living is meant to glorify God and reflect our creator. Do you worry that your life has no meaning or purpose or value? As I mentioned before, talking about this concept of comparison, something I struggle with deeply. Comparison, by the way, which I love, I've heard it described as the thief of joy. But does comparison make you feel small and insignificant? Can I pause and just say, and, and perhaps in this pandemic, right, as, as we're left alone in our thoughts a little bit more, as we're left to reflect uh, the tragedies that are happening around us, some of these thoughts and insecurities can be magnified in times of suffering. Can I just pause and say, the Word of God declares proudly, right, that humanity has purpose, humanity has worth, humanity has value. Yes, as a general whole, but you personally, God knew you before you were formed in your mother's room. God knew you before the creation of the world, the Psalms tells us. These are incredible truths. As we remember, our origin, purpose, and meaning are found in our creator God. Let's unpack this a little bit more. Let's move on to our second division here, humanity created for relationship. That's our second division. Uh, it's found in Genesis, uh, the rest of Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 25. So really what we see here in chapter 2, chapter 1, we see kind of that those summary verses, mankind is created, we're given the responsibility of stewarding uh, the earth. And then, um, you know, God shows us specifically, the word shows us how mankind was created, the creation of Adam, the creation of Eve. And then now we see the Garden of Eden, and we see this perfect picture of what a perfect relationship with our Creator looks like, what God intended us to have at the beginning of time. So chapter uh, 2, verses 4 through 7, uh, we continue to see how God is caring for the earth. Uh, we receive further insight on how God created us, how God created mankind. Um, we read aloud, uh, in we see, excuse me, in verse 7, um, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. It's amazing, right, to ponder that mankind has the very breath of God inside of him. That's, a, that's an unbelievable truth, right? Let's, let's unpack this a little bit more. Verses uh, 8 through 14, um, we are introduced now to the Garden of Eden. Um, now, in the Garden of Eden, um, mankind is given responsibility to care for the garden. Uh, we see the four headwaters in Eden. We see there are all types of trees, all types of vegetation. At the center of the garden is the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Uh, the, so important to note here too, I think it's interesting. The tree of life was also is also found in Revelation uh, chapter 22, verse 2. So we see the tree of life again uh, later in the word. But um, we're introduced to the Garden of Eden. Mankind is given the responsibility to steward the garden. And then in verse um, 17, God gives mankind a warning, right? Um, he says, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So there's a warning here. This is going to be very important next week as we dive into Genesis chapter 3. We see the fall of man. Excuse me. We see the fall of mankind. Um, but here's a warning here, too. So he gives us the responsibility to care for the garden, but he also gives us a warning. And then in verses 18 through 23, uh, we see God creates, God has created Adam, and now God creates Eve. God, as we saw in verse 27, it says, God created man in his own image, male and female, he created him. So God creates uh, a companion for Adam. We see the creation of male and female, uh, male and female, man and woman, um, in equal uh, dignity and worth and value uh, before our creator God. Um, so again, male, female, equal before God. Uh, God saw that it was not good for man to be alone in verse 18. So he makes a helpful, helper um, for Adam. And again, continuing to illustrate this idea that we are created for relationship. We were created from that Trinitarian relationship for relationship with our creator and with others. I love that verse. It is not good for man to be alone. I think all of us are going to look back on this pandemic and we're going to say amen to this verse. It is not good for man to be alone. Quarantine, though maybe necessary, right? For a lot of us, it's not good for us to be alone. We need relationship. We need to be in relationship with one another. Um, look at verse 23, where Adam says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, 
for she was taken out of man. And verse 24 continues to illustrate, and it's a beautiful picture actually, of the marriage relationship. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Our relationship, we were created for meaningful relationships, uh, not just in the marriage relationship, but in relationship with our parents, with our siblings, with our friends, those from our church, those from BSF. And take a look at this verse here as we wrap up uh, in chapter two. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. They felt no shame. I mean, we're going to unpack that verse real quick, but here's a principle we can learn from this second division as we conclude. God's image bearers were created for relationship with him. God's image bearers were created for relationship with him. Now you might ask, how did you get that truth from what we just read in chapter two? Read verse 25 again, because I think it's a great summary verse. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. They felt no shame. Now, if you think they felt no shame, if you ponder what in the world could that have possibly felt like? Because see, we struggle with shame every day, right? We struggle with regret. We struggle with the pain of our past, the mistakes, the sins that we have done. We understand though that the Garden of Eden was a perfect picture of what God intended for humanity, a perfect, peaceful relationship between creator and his creation and his crowning achievement, mankind, right? We talked about, we were created with reason. We were created with intellect, emotions, a a superior um, uh, ability to comprehend and to love. Well, God created those created, created that in us for a reason, right? Because so we can relate to God so that we can, seek him, right? And to find him in relationship with him. And the Garden of Eden is a perfect picture of perfect relationship. Sin had not entered the world. Death had not entered the world. Uh, There was no enmity between, between mankind and God. They were in perfect union. They were in perfect peace and satisfaction. What a beautiful picture. But if you look at the Garden of Eden, you might ask, what in the world happened? Because let me tell you, in 2020, I'm not seeing a lot of Garden of Eden. In fact, we are seeing the exact opposite uh, in the world today. Well, we're going to learn again in chapter three, um, the, this understanding of the fall of mankind. So stay tuned for next week as we unpack um, what happened, what went wrong. Um, but, you know, in short summary, we do know uh, that mankind chose to willfully disobey God. We were separated from God. Our relationship was damaged. Death entered the world. And we looked at this perfect relationship. We looked at creator and creation. We looked at this place of perfect peace. No shame, no guilt, no sin, no regret. Amazing to, to even comprehend that. We looked at that and we said, no thanks. I'd rather go our own way. We'd rather go our own way. We'd rather live our own lives. We'd rather willfully disobey our creator, God. And unfortunately, you have this idea of sin. And by the way, I am at my house um, Sunday night football is on right now. So if you just heard somebody scream through the room, I don't know if you heard that, but my parents are watching football. It is what it is. It's the, re- it's the reality of living at home and lecturing from home. So if you hear screaming, it's because my parents are watching Sunday night football. Okay, back to this idea of a perfect relationship with God. We obviously see that this relationship was damaged, right? We see the, un- the, the effects of sin in the world through the pandemic, through social un- unrest, through injustice in our world. But God still desires to seek relationship with mankind. As we're going to learn in chapter three, yes, our relationship was severely damaged, but it was not irreparably damaged. It was not eternally damaged. We're going to see in chapter three, a hint of God's redemption plan for the world. See, the second person in the Trinity, as we mentioned, Jesus present at creation, right? The eternal second person of the Trinity of the Godhead. He came down from heaven through his death and resurrection, provided a way, provided the way for humanity to get back to his, its creator. Look again, right? We look at the Garden of Eden. This is what God intended. God wants relationship with his people. Sin damaged that. Sin separated us from our creator. But in Jesus Christ, we find relationship with our creator God restored we find this idea of no shame, no guilt. We find that again through Jesus Christ. God 
desires relationship with us. That reality alone should cause us to wonder. I mean, that is amazing, right? The creator of the universe wants a relationship with us. We see that clearly in chapter two. And throughout the life of Jesus and through his death and resurrection, we, conti- we again see that God is continuing to seek after relationship with us. If we only come to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, we will see that relationship restored. We will see our sins completely forgiven. We will receive the new life of Jesus Christ. And with that, in, as we see in the book of Revelation, we will get to participate in humanity, in, in creation restored. And we'll see a hint of that again next week in chapter three. So what, do we, what does this mean for us today as we conclude? Um, what does this all mean? Well, first and foremost, um, if you're anything like me, we, I struggle with insecurity. I struggle with comparison. Um, and especially in these times of, of maybe exacerbated loneliness, um, we struggle uh, greatly with our, our meaning and our purpose in this life. But the Bible says our foundational identity, our core identity is found in the immeasurable worth of, given to us by our creator. You are created in the image and likeness of God. You have his worth and his dignity because we reflect his glory. We reflect his glory in the, in the very existence of our being, and we reflect his glory, glory in what we do. And secondly, as we understand God seeking relationship with his people, um, I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you've been. I don't know if you have come to faith in Christ or if you've been a Christian for many years. All I can say is God desires that you come to him in repentance and faith through his son so that he can see relationship with you restored. It's a profound truth. It's a beautiful truth. And it's an incredible reality. It gives meaning to our existence. It gives us hope in the midst of suffering. If you have a question on what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a follower of Christ, I encourage you to reach out to any of your uh, of our teaching staff here at St. Louis Young Adults, your group leader, um, maybe even uh, the friend who invited you to join us at BSF. God wants relationship with his people. We'll see how it was damaged but we see in the person of Jesus Christ how that relationship was restored. That's enough to give us hope for the here and now and hope for the future, knowing that all of creation ultimately will be restored as God will forever destroy sin and death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you speak to us in your word through the book of Genesis. Lord, um, I don't know what's going on in the hearts of all of our class members, but I do know that many of us carry burdens of insecurity, burdens of loneliness, uh, burdens of fear of the future, uh, wondering if we have any purpose or meaning in this life. God, I pray that you would speak loudly through your spirit from your word to all of us to shout, to declare in our hearts that we do have meaning and worth. We do have an eternal significance given to us by you. God, I also pray for those who have not come to faith in you, Lord, through your son, that you would remind them that you seek relationship with them. Yes, our relationship has been damaged. Yes, sin and death are realities. But God, you have made the way to bridge the gap between mankind and you through your son, Jesus. And God, I pray that people would come to faith in your son as we reflect on these truths. And God, for those who have already come to faith in Christ, God, would you remind us of our identity, of of the reality of who we are in you, the eternal significance that we have in knowing you and understanding our relationship with you. Keep us safe, God. Continue to bless us. And we thank you, Lord, for preserving your word in Genesis. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us again. Um, Stay tuned next week as we learn about the fall of mankind, but also God's redemptive plan for the world in Genesis chapter three. Uh, Thanks so much and uh, stay safe. God bless you guys. Thanks again for listening to the St. Louis Young Adults BSF podcast. Join us on Zoom next Monday at 7 p.m. Central Time as we learn about the fall of mankind and God's redemptive plan for the world from Genesis chapter three. 
To connect with our class, like us on Facebook at STLYABSF or visit bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. Bible Study Fellowship is an international, interdenominational, nonprofit organization that is dedicated to studying God's Word one verse at a time and strengthening the local church. For more information, visit bsfinternational.org. That's bsfinternational.org.